the end of times, basically, in Judaism, that concept is, what is it in, exactly uh, in Judaism? And of course, we know what it is in the in versus Christian Bible, you know, um, with the teachings there. But in the reality of Judaism, the end of times or the end, you know, that sort of thing. What is that all about, Rabbi? It's the, the error when, um, most critically, that the knowledge of God will fill the world. You know, it is our hope as Jews, as followers of the God of Israel, that all the nations would turn to him and speak in a pure speech as Zephaniah envisioned. And when, when the whole world will praise the God of Israel alone and serve him alone, and God will then be king over the world. It is a very, um, just an explanation for this, um, that's the key point of the messianic age. There, there, there might be. I don't. I've never counted it, so I'm, I'm making up this number. But there may be, let's say, 500 passages that are messianic in the Jewish scriptures, and I don't. I, I've never even counted it. I have no idea. Um, but what I do have an idea about is that of those, I'm just making up the number 500. Uh, of those, only three or four are about the Messiah himself, maybe eight or nine. There are very few about the Mashiach himself. The, the, Mashi, the, the, the Mashiach, just as a point, is, is Mashiach means anointed. That's a critical word. And wh what does that mean, anointed? It means really Moshach, really means to pour. And it means that God will restore the Davidic dynasty and the descent of King David. In fact, the Messiah is called David in Ezekiel 37, 24, and 25. Um, and he's called that a little bit early in Ezekiel as well. That the promise made to King David in 2 Samuel chapter uh, 7, verse 12 through 16, uh, is fulfilled, that the Davidic house is restored. But if you look at Tanakh, you just think about it, you know, if there are 500 messianic passages, and let's say 10 of them are explicitly describing the Messiah, let's just make it easy, okay? That tells you something. The central point is that it's about the redemption of the world, that the whole world will return back to the God of Israel. It's the Mashiach is very important, but he's not the central theme, just as although God used Moses as a, a vessel to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt um, and to perform miracles through him and his brother, but Moses couldn't part a sea. Uh, Moses could not allow the Jewish people to walk through uh, the Red Sea on dry land, uh, nor could he have... Um, on his own, make water come from a rock or food come out of heaven or, and so on, that God was using Moses. And that's why at the Passover Seder, Moses' name is barely mentioned. So it's, very, it's actually virtually never mentioned. So it's, it's interesting that if you look at the Passover Seder, which is without a doubt the, the, fest, the, the festivity, the meal that is most pregnant with ritual is the is the uh, Passover Seder. One of the things that's very striking is that Moses' name is not mentioned. And one of the striking things about looking at messianic prophecy is, again, we find that the person who God is going to use is barely mentioned. It really is very much about that the whole world will know about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and the whole world will be redeemed. And that's why it will eclipse the messianic age. And what will happen essentially is that the world will return back to a position it was prior to the sin of Adam and Eve. And we see that in a very um, a gorgeous passage in Isaiah chapter 11. Um, there's a beautiful passage where we talks about famously the lamb will lie with the lion. But it says that, that a very interesting passage that a little child you will play over the hole of a, a poisonous snake. That's a very interesting thing that a baby is going to be able to be without fear near a snake. Why that? Why not, you know, people won't have to worry about earthquakes, that a, 
a, a child could stick his head in a crocodile. No, it's specifically in, a child will play near a, co- a, a poisonous snake because what it means is at that time no longer will the snake be able to harm a person so that's a throwback to Genesis 3.15 that no longer will the snake be able to injure or bring harm to mankind because essentially the world, the whole world will know about the God of Israel and therefore people will not rebel against the God of Israel any longer. They will make errors, mistakes because we're not going to become um, robots we're still creatures of habit, but there'll be unintentional sins, not intentional sins. And that's, that's very critical. And it is for us to hope every day that the Messiah would come today. If, if the whole point of the Tanakh is that there's, a, there's very few verses in the Hebrew Scriptures in the Old Testament that talks about who the Messiah is, how is it that the New Testament reversed it and made it so much about who it was and very little about the time? The answer is very obvious. The new, even although Christianity is using the, the vernacular, the conventional vernacular of the Jewish scriptures, it's using words like the Messiah, uh, it's using in Greek uh, Christos, uh, Christ, that's a Greek word, it had no meaning to the Greeks prior to the advent of Christianity. That term just meant nothing. I know some people might think that uh, Christ was Jesus' last name and he was a son of uh, Mary and Joseph Christ, but that's not the case. So although they are using the language of the Jewish scriptures, they're actually, they are completely misappropriating it. Christianity is not about Mashiach of the Jewish scriptures. Christianity is about the worship of Jesus. And if you're not sure, you can go into any church. I'm not saying to go, but if you did, and you were there with a counter, and you count how many times Jesus' name comes up, you, you know, you'd be in the hundreds on a, in, in, a, in a, a tent revival. It's not that I go every afternoon, but it's that constantly. It is, if you ask a Christian, what does it mean to be a Christian? So if you ask, they'll say very simply, I love Jesus, and Jesus died for my sins. That's what it is. And he rose on the third day for my sins. It is all about Jesus. If you ask a Jew, what is he waiting for for the Mashiach, we're not talking about worshiping a person. If you ask a Jew, if you look at the Jewish scriptures and you've never heard of Christianity in your life, if you would, ne- let's say you're a Yemenite Jew. Yemenite Jews never encountered Christians. Christians were never in Yemen. The Muslims never allowed Christians to be in Yemen. So they really, Yemenite Jews, never encountered Christianity. If you would ask a Yemenite Jew, they, when you ask them what does it mean to be a Jew, uh, they would tell you it's about the whole world knowing about the God of Israel. And yes, God will keep his promise to King David and restore the Davidic dynasty, and he will be a prince. It's described 17 times at the end of Ezekiel. He's called the prince it, most of it is passingly. That's why I don't count those really messianic passages, meaning about the Messiah. It tells us that he'll bring offerings, sacrifices in Ezekiel 45 and 46. But he is passing, and uh, he, relatively speaking, because it, Christianity is real. When Christians say to you that I love Jesus, and what it means to be a Christian is Jesus died for my sins, they're not kidding. They are not, they, they are, this is not a messianic type of movement. It is a worship of a man completely. I mean, and in case anyone thinks I'm like making this up, you could ask a hundred Christians who are, you know, devout Christians. What does it mean to be a Christian? They will tell you, they won't, they won't say, they, they, of course they believe in the Father, God created the universe, all Christians will tell you that. But they will tell you right away, it means that I believe that Jesus died for my sins and rose on the third day, and I love Jesus, period. It means I love Jesus. That's it. It is about worshiping Jesus. They're using the language. They're misappropriating language, which makes it very confusing. So we're using the same word, whether it's uh, Mashiach in Hebrew, uh, Christ in Greek, Messiah. We're using the same word, but we mean something completely different by this. And obviously, if you read Tanakh, 
you have to ask yourself the question, what does the, the timeless passage of our scriptures of prophecy comport with? Does it comport with worshiping a man and a man dying for the sins of the world and rising on the third day? In fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he says that Jesus rose on the third day. It's really the only verse that tells us that Jesus rose on the third day is uh, 1 Corinthians 15. The, the, the Gospels don't say when Jesus rose. They just say when they found the tomb empty. But the key is, he says, according to the Scripture. And you ask yourself, what Scripture? There is no such Scripture. There is no Scripture that says that the Messiah is going to die and rise on the third day. So Paul actually makes a reference to something that's a non-existent passage or a passage taken completely out of, ridiculously out of context. There is no passage. So Paul is saying this is absolutely, because this is like Paul's possibly the most, the most well-known chapter of all of the writings of Paul is 1 Corinthians 15. That's about the crucifixion and resurrection. And he's saying that's everything. And he's saying, if Jesus didn't rise, then we are all, in, our faith is completely in vain. I mean, that's everything. Paul is telling the truth, meaning he is, he, he, like his followers today, are accurately conveying what Christians believe. I'm not setting up a straw man and toppling it. It is, not, it's not about Jesus being a prophet or a teacher or, that's not what it's about. Christians do believe that Jesus was a teacher and a preacher and a person who told parables and all those things. But that is not the central centerpiece of Christianity. And the centerpiece is he is a God-man and he is to be worshipped and he defeated the grave and rose for your sins. So he's a, he is the, he is the uh, mother load of human sacrifice and idolatry of worshiping a man who died for your sins and then rose on the third day. And every, every child of God who is curious about the truth needs to ask the question. It's odd because we don't have 1 Corinthians 15 anywhere in the Jewish scriptures, which is 23,000 verses. And that number, I can tell you, is a little more than 23,000 verses. And you have to ask the question, why don't we have a chapter that looks like 1 Corinthians 15 anywhere in the, anywhere, when I say anywhere, I mean anywhere in the Jewish scriptures. And every Christian watching this show, I, I encourage you to go to the Jewish Bible and measure these fantastic claims of Christianity against it. And the Jewish scriptures is saying that human sacrifice is forbidden that means vicarious atonement, that one person can die in order to, who is righteous, could die in order as a sacrifice to die for the sins of the wicked. The prophets say that's absolutely forbidden. So it can be confusing to people because most people, although 86% of Americans are believers in God, the United States is a very religious country, most people I encounter have never read the Bible once in their entire life, from beginning to end, just once. And people who are Christians need to ask the question, you know what, if I read the Jewish Bible, I'm not finding these passages. I'm not finding anything like this. There is, of course, discussion of the Messiah, but when we talk about the Messiah, he is very much a person who is what? Who is, um, who fears God, Isaiah chapter 11. He could come in any generation, which means there are... Why is the Messiah called a branch? I just want to talk about this for a moment, because people ask me this question often. We see that the Messiah is called a branch a number of places in the Jewish... Why is he called a branch? Now, I want to just heighten this question so you, you get this point. Jesse, his father, is called the root, right? If there's only supposed to be one person who can never be the Messiah, that's the Christian model, then he should be called the tree, not a branch. But in fact, the Messiah is a human being, and in each generation there is somebody else who's ready to step forward if the Jewish people repent and fulfill the mandate of Isaiah 59, verse 20, where it says that the, the Redeemer will come to Zion to those who, re, who repent in Jacob. The Mashiach can only be launched to a generation that does tshuva. Now, in every, uh, the Messiah is a human being, and he, a baby cannot, 
uh, be a king, it has to be a mature adult. And therefore, in every generation, if the generation does, is, does not merit that the Messiah would come in that generation, then that person dies. And there's somebody else from the house of David, and there are thousands of people who I know, I know many of them, who are direct descendants of the house of David. There's another person waiting that if the, that generation deserves that he might come, then he is ready to step forward. In every generation of somebody, it's a different person. And that's why it's called a branch, because you have a tree. That's one tree. You have one tree stump, but you have hundreds of branches. Maybe some trees have thousands of branches. I don't know. But the key, what is being conveyed is that it's any one of those branches that could be the person who will step in to fulfill the, the mandate the promise that God made to King David, and usher in a messianic age. But how could he do it? Just the same way Moses did it. He can't do it. It is God who said to Moses, I will be with you. And Moses asked, how is it possible I could do this? God said, I will be with you. Period. And that's what so it, Christianity is about, is all about worshiping human being. It's within some general framework of Judaism, meaning they believe in the Jewish Bible, the, 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 the record of the creation of the world, the record of, of Noah, the flood, the record of Abraham. They're all curious about it. They all believe that. But that's it. It is a completely, it's, it's not just a different orientation, which I think is what Christians believe. Or what, most, what is conventionally accepted is it's just a different orientation. It isn't. Christianity is about worshiping a man. Who is created in our, who we create in our image? I mean, who is Jesus? He's someone who's, who we will never be. That's what Christianity presents him as. He's someone who's sinless. He's someone who can't do anything wrong. He's someone who's born of a virgin. He's perfect. And most importantly, he defeats the grave, which is very important to people because this is a person's biggest fear, is the fear of death. We are the only creatures on earth that know that we're going to die. No other animal knows it's going to die. They're not even aware of that. Only we are. And therefore, if we go back in time, thousands of years, religions were all about how to defeat death. And if you take death out of the picture, the equation, every religion in the world practically would just disappear. Judaism would be completely irrelevant to us. For us, it's about raising God, that God's name should be raised up above every name. It's not about us being served or benefiting from it. And I, I, just a point that must be said, in a strange way, this will seem surprising to the listeners, it, there is a benefit for us that the Messiah doesn't come so fast. Why? Because we're in the night now. We are in, it's still night. The morning is soon coming. The light is soon coming, but it is still dark. That means we're living in a time when people can choose to reject the God of Israel or embrace him, to bow before him or to turn their back, to blaspheme him or to raise their tongue in praise of him. When Mashiach comes, it will be everyone will know the truth. So in a way, now, if a person accepts the God of Israel in his or her life and bows before him, they, that person is, receives tremendous reward for such a thing. Why? Because to be a Jew means to be hated by the world. It means to be despised by the world, to be rejected by all the nations on earth. They curse us in Sweden every day. So therefore, in a sense, if I can, it's like every day that a person embraces the God of Israel, now your bank account is getting an automatic deposit, so to speak. It's very beneficial. The Messiah coming is really about, we don't want this for us, it's for God. Because when the Messiah comes, then everyone will know. It won't be a big deal to worship the God of Israel. Everyone will know. It will be in Yiddish, amplect. It will be uncovered. So it's a very intriguing thing. Christianity is very much about covering two critical points, but one most important, that is overcoming death. That what Christianity provides is very, what it claims to provide is very important to people. And that is you're going to go to heaven, you're not going to go to hell. That means it eliminates that fear. It's serving you. It also, you have someone to talk to. You're an invisible friend all the time. I don't mean it derisively, but this is very important to people. Now, so the key is Christianity delivers what people crave.
In Judaism, it's really the opposite. In a way, in a sense, and I'm saying this to heighten a point, in a way, a person might say, I really would prefer that the Messiah takes his time. Why? Because every day my bank account is getting bigger and bigger. Now the mitzvah's commandments really count. When the Messiah comes, then there's going to be uh, no temptation to sin. So therefore, when a Jew waits for Mashiach, it's the antithesis of Christianity. We don't want to, we're getting, we're, we are being served now better, if it's for me personally, it's better that the Mashiach doesn't come. Why? Because personally, if it, if it is about serving me and taking care of my needs, my needs are much better served. I get much more reward for worshiping God of Israel now than when the Messiah comes. And therefore, a, Maimonides says something exquisite, and most people miss this. In the 13 principles of, the fundamental principles of our faith, the 12th is the belief in the coming of the Messiah. But, my, but what is added in there is that even, even though he tarries, this is essential to our belief. We must hope that he comes today. Therefore, what does that mean, really? What, what do you mean, uh, even though he tarries? Why do you have to add that in? That means there are other creeds. Why didn't it say, and even though it's hard to worship one God, you know, but I still worship one God. When it comes to Mashiach, we're supposed to not just believe that he will come, but hope that he comes today. Why is, why is that a part of our creed? That sounds to most people like a word of encouragement. Even though it doesn't, it, most people see that statement of the central creed of Judaism as look, even though it doesn't look good, or it really requires a lot of faith because it's been a while, but don't give up hope. That's, that's a complete mistake. What we are saying is the opposite. Judaism is not what we can get. We can get a better if Mashiach doesn't come in a way because we have much more reward now. We're saying is we don't want to be the master and that the Messiah serves us. We want the Messiah to come today. Why? So that God's name will be raised up above every name. That every tongue will praise Him. That every knee will bow to Him. So we're not looking to get anything out of it. We want it all for God. So therefore, in, in the classical, traditional Judaism, we are the servant and God is the master and we're here to serve Him. In the Christian model, really, it, it, Christianity is really, the, the Christians are the masters. They are the ones who are being serviced and served by Jesus and their waiter. And I, I don't mean that derisively, but that which delivers eternal life to make sure I go to heaven, that I don't go to hell. So we, Judaism is completely the opposite. It's not for us, it's that God's name will be raised up above every name. And that's, that's the critical difference. So the, we, Christianity and Judaism, are using the same language. But we mean something very different when we use a term like the Messiah. We mean something very different when we use the term like even God. Um, in Christian theology, you know, for most Christians, God is a three-person Godhead. Satan is something completely different. Uh, Christianity, incidentally, uh, invented nothing. It borrowed everything. What you're, what you're looking at is essentially a conflation of, 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 of course, a Jewish basic framework of history and then the idea of a god name, which is something that was ubiquitous throughout the Greco-Roman world. Adon asher Vehu 
ריבון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נסע וחפץ על כל אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נסע וחפץ על כל אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובר בתפארה והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נשא וחפץ הכל אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא